watching online and we'll be praying for everybody who has been accidentally sleeping in. <laughs> Amen. Well, we're glad that you're here and we're just going to worship the Lord together and trust God for good things. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and let's just uh, 
open our time in a word of prayer. And I just want to invite you to go ahead and just invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into this place, but into your heart. That he would help you to take every thought captive this morning to the authority of Jesus Christ so that he becomes our sole focus. You know, all of us have things on our minds all the time. I got stuff on my mind this morning. And uh, I'm just praying that I'm able to let that go and give it all to the Lord. And he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be together. I pray, Father, that there would be a very strong sense of your presence and your spirit here today. God, that we would be drawn into that. Help us to keep our eyes solely on you. You must increase. We must decrease. We just ask for your anointing upon our time together. Father, I pray for a release of healing power today on all who are not well. Would you touch them and visit them in a mighty way? The Lord will give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning. Take a few minutes and greet some people around you. The Lord bless you.
yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord.
Let's just lift our hands towards him this morning. Let's fill this place with thanksgiving today. Hallelujah. What a great Savior.
ocean poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus our affection Will you bow with me, please, in a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we count it a privilege and an honor to be able to gather in your name today, to gather with your people. We love you this morning, Lord. We recognize today, God, that there are Many of our church family that can't be here because of physical issues that they're struggling with, God. And Lord, we think of uh, Billy and Helen this morning. And Lord, we're looking to you for a miracle in their lives, in their lives. God, that you would touch Helen and heal these hips, Lord God, and restore her health to her. Pray for Julie today, God. That you would aid her in her recovery, Lord, and that you would take away the pain. We pray, God, for Willie and Christina and their family as they mourn the loss of a loved one, that you would bring them comfort, Lord. And Father, I just thank you for this privilege of being able to look into your word and uh, I pray, God, that your anointing would be on me. That I would properly handle your word today. I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite some uh, very cool people to come up and join me. And this is a very elite club. You've got to be uh, 12 years of age or younger. So why don't you guys come on up here, guys and girls, and uh, join me as we get ready to dismiss you to Kids Church. All right. Very cool. Good looking group. If only I weren't up here, right? All right. <laughs> Lord, thank you for...
for the blessing of children. Please open their hearts wide to whatever you have for them today. And Lord, bless those that are ministering to them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can head downstairs with those two nice ladies back there. Right on. I'm going to invite uh, Bobby to come up here for a moment. He has asked if he could share a quick announcement. And uh, so I told him I'd let him have a few seconds. Good morning, everyone. So as some of you know, I'm working with Youth Unlimited again this summer, and uh, we're launching uh, Youth Alpha for the second time this summer. And so what that is, is if you know the Alpha course, it's basically the same thing but for youth. It's a video series that talks about faith, culture, religion, and the role of Jesus, and uh, the importance of the Bible. And we are going to be launching that for nine weeks with our students, uh, ages 12 to 19, and it's beginning Wednesday. Uh, June 21st, and we are in need of people to provide meals for our Alpha sessions. So if you are willing to provide a meal for us, uh, talk to me after the service. Let me know I can get you my email and we can coordinate something. But uh, please keep us in prayers. We've got a lot of exciting things happening at the Youth Center, and it's going to be a great summer. So thank you. All right, there is a luncheon downstairs following the service, and uh, everybody's invited to stay for that. And uh, we missed you last Sunday. We were in Niagara for a family get together, uh, visiting with my aunt and my cousin, and her husband from England. And it was really nice to see them, and uh, I haven't seen them, either of them, in a long time. I haven't seen my cousin since I was 18. And so we had a great time together. And this afternoon, the Gilbert family are headed to St. Thomas for a family get together with Elisa's brother from North Carolina. And uh, so uh, we're going to be heading there following the service today. But it's so good to be back here with you. And I want to thank you for putting up with the video worship last week. <laughs> But I'm so glad that everything worked well. If you have your Bible with you, please turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. You can also follow along in your message notes that are included in the bulletin. And we're working our way through the summer months through this incredible little letter. And there's so much in here. We spent four weeks just on chapter 1. And uh, so... We're going to be here for a little while, but it's good. And uh, I want to thank my good friend Mark Hardwick for bringing a, a powerful word last Sunday. And uh, we're so blessed to have them close by. And uh, he and his family are going to be helping us out with our day camp, and uh, which is coming up. And please keep that in prayer. Ephesians uh, chapter 2. And I'm going to invite you to stand this morning while we read the word of God. It says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. You may be seated. Paul, the apostle, opens this chapter with a very, very abrupt statement. And uh, he said to his recipients, to his readers, as for you, you were dead. And uh, this statement is it's, it's meant to, to grab the reader's attention. I'll submit that it's there to even shock us. How can a living person be dead? Well, the statement doesn't really make sense uh, until we link it to Paul's line of thoughts from chapter 1. Remember in the original text, there were no chapter divisions. And so in Ephesians 1, Paul praised God for his power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's verse 20. Jesus was dead in the tomb until God resurrected him. Paul then taught that he wanted our minds to be open to the fact that the, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us, it is available to us, and as Jesus was dead and, and resurrected in a spiritual sense, we were dead too. And God raised us. Paul is, is introducing a rich theological concept here called regeneration. Love how Chuck Swindoll explains this in his commentary on Ephesians. He says, this is what we call being born again, made alive in the eyes of God and spiritually incorporated into Christ. Now believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit who makes us willing and able to do what was impossible in our spiritually dead state. In our spiritually dead state, we were cut off from God. God is our true source of life. And if we're not connected to God, even though we breathe air, we're not really alive. So what we're going to do today is answer four questions. What is life like without Jesus? What did God do for us? Why did God do it? How can we receive it? Simple stuff today. So let's dive in. First of all, what is life like without Jesus? Well, Paul pulls no punches as he begins this section. Verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And that is the state of every human being without Jesus. All of us in here today, everybody who's watching online, who are born again and have a relationship with Jesus Christ, were in this state before we came to Jesus. And it's called being spiritually dead. People search for meaning in life all the time, and they come up short every single time because they're spiritually dead and without Jesus. The late Freddie Mercury, who was the front man of the once very famous English rock band Queen, he said this, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And that is the most bitter type of loneliness Success has brought me world idolization and millions of pounds, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. You can actually, you can go on YouTube and see dozens, if not hundreds of celebrities talking about how empty their lives are. Without Jesus, we're spiritually dead. Now, why does Paul say once we were dead? We were dead in our transgressions and sins, and it encompasses every human being. You know, in a different letter, Romans 3.23, Paul says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Every human being alive except for Jesus. That includes every religious figure, the Pope, every king, Every human being, even Mother Teresa, we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And without Jesus, that's all of us. What's it like without Jesus? What does spiritual death look like? Paul mentions three things. He says, first of all, without Jesus, we follow the ways of the world. 
Verse 1, Paul said, we were dead in transgressions and sins. Verse 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. The ways of the world is in direct opposition and contradiction to the ways of Christ. Paul talks about this throughout his letters, but in Ephesians 4 and 5, Paul talks in detail about the ways of the world. I'll just highlight some of them for you. Sensuality, lust, speaking falsehoods, anger, theft, unwholesome talk, bitterness, rage, brawling, slander, malice. Ephesians 5 verses 3 to 7, Paul says, Among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. And that is always on display before us in our nation and applauded. Or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Paul says, for this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. This and, and so much more are the ways of the world. And Paul said uh, that in our transgressions and in our sins, uh, we followed those ways one time because we were spiritually dead. Secondly, without Christ, we follow the ways of Satan. Now, this, this, Paul carries this thought a little bit further. He equates the ways of the world with the ways of Satan. They're, they're really the same. Verse 2 continues. And of, the ruler, uh, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Paul doesn't sugarcoat this, neither will I. If you are not following the Lord, you're following the devil. Uh, listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 12, verse 30, Jesus said this. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not work with me is working against me. If you follow the ways of the world, which are contrary to the ways of Jesus, Paul is saying, you're actually following the ways of Satan. The Bible describes him as the enemy of our souls. In our state of being spiritually dead, we're cut off from God and we're following the enemy of our soul. Now, I'm not here to sing the praises of the devil, you know that. I'm going to give you some insight here, though, okay? Satan does have some power and a whole lot of influence in this world. And I want you to notice something. Paul called him, with lowercase letters, the ruler of the kingdom of the air. What does that mean? It does not mean that Satan has control of this earth. God is and always will be in control. However, he does have incredible influence in this world, but the influence is temporary. And it's only for a time. And that time has been determined by God. At some point in the culmination of all things, Satan's time will be up and God will cast him into the lake of fire where he will be punished for all of eternity, and then the earth will finally be rid of his influence. His influence and his authority and his sway in this world are temporary. The kingdom of Christ is eternal and all-powerful. Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, it says, Therefore God exalted him, that's Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every politician, every president, every prime minister, every dictator, every monarch, every angel, every demon, and Satan himself are going to bow their knee and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His time is short. 
Without Jesus, we follow the ways of the world, we follow the ways of Satan, and then Paul mentions the third thing here, and it's, it's equal with these two, it's following our own evil desires. It's a big one. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. You know the story of Adam and Eve and their fall into sin? And because of that, every human that followed is born with a sin nature. We've all given into that sin nature many, many times. Now this is the kicker. Sometimes as believers, even though sin is no longer our master and Jesus is, we still give into the cravings of the sin nature. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and as long as we rely on his power, we won't cave into those sinful desires and all those things that Paul talked about. But we're, we're never going to be sinless until we get to eternity. But when we rely on the Holy Spirit, we can sin less. Now, without Jesus, that's what life is like. Because of that, at the end of verse 3, Paul says, like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. All that means is we're deserving of the punishment that awaits unrepentant sinners. The fact of the matter is this, that without Jesus, we are on our way to a lost eternity. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Case closed. What about people who never heard the name of Jesus? You know, I've been a Christian for quite a long time. And I've heard the debate on this issue. The people with, that have never heard about Jesus, where will they go? What about them? I have to answer this question with scripture, okay? Romans 1, 18 to 20, it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. That's why we send missionaries and global workers to nations where they've never heard the gospel so that they can hear it and come to Jesus in faith believing. Unless you come to Jesus, in faith believing, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven regardless of whether you've heard his name or not. That's the Bible. That's not Jesus. Was it what they say? Don't, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> okay? Life without Jesus. The second question. What did God do for us? I apologize if that font is so small. I, uh, Every time I was typing it in, no matter what I did, it made it that small. It's computers are sometimes under the influence of demonic activity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> since, since we were spiritually dead, we needed life. We needed to be raised up. We needed a fresh start. And that's exactly what God provided for us. Verse 4 begins with an incredible statement. It says, but because of his great love for us, God, I'll stop there for a minute. This is one of those uh, but God verses in the Bible. And whenever you encounter those verses, get ready to be filled with hope. The situation is bleak. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. We consistently and constantly gave in to the cravings of our own sinful natures. But God. If you want an incredible line of Bible study, look up all the but God verses in the New Testament, and it will fill you with hope and with excitement. Those are life-changing words. And this verse says a couple things about God's character. It says, first of all, that he loves us. That he loves us. And it's very important for us to know, most people do not live their lives knowing the love of God. Even Christians when in the face of suffering, forget how much God loves them. I'll never forget years ago, 
watching uh, Billy Graham being interviewed by Larry King. It, he's been interviewed, Larry interviewed him many, many times. Larry King asked him, in all your years of ministry and all the things that you have seen, what is the one thing that stands out to you the most? The one thing that surprises you to this day? And without hesitation or delay, Billy answered, Jesus loves me, this I know. Paul's prayer, my prayer for all of you is that you become well acquainted with the love of God. That you understand and know how much God loves you. Loves you. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. And he cares for you deeply. He not only loves us, but secondly, he's rich in mercy. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, and then verse 5, God who is rich in mercy. You know, God could have said, these, these, uh, these stubborn people, they're never going to learn their lesson. All they want is evil, and I said, I'm done with it, it's dead. He sent Jesus to make a way for us. That's mercy. Mercy and his mercy is limitless. What did God do? Verse 5, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. A couple things that God did. First, he made us alive. We were dead in sin. God made us alive in Christ. And this is salvation. And salvation is a form of resurrection. That same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the power that raises, up, raises us up out of spiritual death and gives us new life. How? It's by grace you have been saved. It is, it is an act of grace. None of us deserve it. None of us can earn it. There's no amount of good works that we can do that will ever get us there. And you notice in verse 4 that mercy is mentioned and in verse 5 that grace is mentioned. Salvation is an act of grace and mercy. Grace is getting something that we don't deserve and which is salvation and mercy is not getting something that we do deserve which is eternal punishment. Grace and mercy. Oh, I hope you thank God every single day for his grace and his mercy on you. He made us alive. The next thing that God did for us is that he gives us heaven. He gives us heaven. Verse 6, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. I don't know, that not that an incredible truth that fills you with excitement this morning? Friends, we were dead, but God made us alive. We were sinking in sin, but God raised us to a new clean life. We were destined for eternal judgment, but God saved us and reserved a seat for us in heaven with Jesus. We were helpless to do any of this. God did it all by placing us in Jesus. That leads to a third question this morning. Why? Why did God save us? Why would God go to such great, great lengths to rescue dead sinful people? I'm going to tell you, it's not because we're all so wonderful. All right? Um, it's really because he's so wonderful. We touched on a couple of things already. He loved us. He's rich in mercy. He's full of grace. But verse 7 shows us another reason. It says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You know what? We're saved. Not only because of grace and because he loves us and because he's rich in mercy, we're also saved so that other people in ages to come will see the incredible grace and kindness of God that has been given to us so that they too can be saved. Our lives are a testimony to God's saving grace. Our lives uh, testify to that fact. Paul talks about this in Titus 
chapter 2, the first 10 verses, but in verse 10, his prayer is, is that in every way they, so all followers of Christ, will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Do you attract people to Jesus? If you indulge in the sinful practices that Paul mentions, you're not. I can go through a whole list of scenarios this morning. You complain about your boss at work, are you making the gospel attractive? On and on the list goes, in every way, make the teaching about God attractive so that people might come to Jesus. Amen. One last question, number four. How can we receive this gift? It's answered for us, verses eight and nine, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Let me break this apart. Three things. First of all, God is the source of salvation. Yeah. The text clearly says it's the gift of God. So God's the source. He provides it and he gives it freely to whoever will receive it. Secondly, it's a supernatural gift. Even though the means of it was an earthly crucifixion, it was the death of Jesus that provides for our salvation and there's nothing worldly of this world involved in our salvation. It's completely supernatural. Verse 9 teaches there's no work that we can do that will merit salvation. It takes something not of this world. It takes Jesus. And then thirdly, we're saved by grace through faith. It is by grace through faith. That's the only way people can get saved. Not by following a list of rules and regulations. It's not by what you eat and don't eat. It's not by being religious. It is by grace. Through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Jesus and that's it. Nobody else. The Father initiated the plan, the Son implement, implemented the plan, the Holy Spirit empowers the plan. All we have to do is receive it. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He further says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. In other words, our mouth is speaking what our heart is believing. In different passages, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you desire salvation this morning, it's very simple. You have to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. Now, some people confess with their mouths but don't believe it in their hearts. You've got to believe it first and then speak it. Paul concludes this section in verse 10 of Ephesians 2. And we're going to develop this one a little bit further next week. But after he talks all about this, I love this verse. He says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Another translation says, you are God's workmanship. I even read a translation that says, you are God's masterpiece. God had great plans for your life long ago, long before he created the world. He knew that in 2023 you were going to be here. He's got things for you to do. And he's waiting on you to call on him. Amen. Let's bow please.
try to give this invitation every week because I in no way have any ability to read a person's mind or what's on a person's heart. That's between you and God. What I can do is point you to you point you in the right direction. And I can lead you in a prayer of response that will help you confess your faith in Jesus Christ but you got to believe it in your heart. We're willing to do that today. Maybe you're uh, watching online. You're willing to do that today. Why don't you say a little prayer like this? Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. there is nothing I can do that will get me into heaven. So today, I ask that you would give me your grace and mercy. Today I say that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe he not only died for my sins but rose again to seal the victory please forgive me of my sins give me a fresh start be my Lord and my Savior in Jesus name and Father I just pray your blessing upon these dear people today may they sense and know your love and your grace walk in your love and in your truth in this day and age God when darkness all around us seems to be increasing let us be the light that, shine, that shines brightly and points people to the way of Jesus Christ bless your people and keep them in good health I pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, yes, thank you. Before we close, I forgot to mention this earlier. Next Sunday, uh, we're not going to be having a service here. It will be at the Baseball Diamond for the Muskrat Community Church Service. Um, kind of weird for me to use the word muskrat in line with the church service, but there it is. <laughs> um, we're going to be uh, doing a joint service with some other churches in town. And um, so, uh, yeah, we would love for you all to be a part of that. We will have somebody here at our at the church till about quarter past ten. If you would like to, to drop off your tithe and offering, you can. You can also do it by e-transfer. Or you can visit our website and on the home page at the bottom we have a little give button you can give by debit card or credit card as well and we're gonna have a great time in the tent at the ball diamond next sunday all right god bless you